Welcome. This is Dr. Curtis Ronstedler, who is a postdoctorate research fellow with IRIS, Interchange Forum for Reflecting on Intelligent Systems at the University of Stuttgart. His current research investigates how literature can be used as a tool for critically reflecting on intelligent systems in 21st century English lit. His first book, Alchemy and Exemplary in Medieval English Literature, was recently published with Palgrave Macmillan's New Middle Ages series. He's recently written on empathy and AI and Clara and the Sun and Ian McEwan's Machines Like Me. He's also written on Game of Thrones and Alchemy, Sympathetic Werewolves of Medieval Romance, Vampire Theology and Stephen King and more. And he is trained in TEFL as well. Welcome and over to you, Curtis. We look forward to hearing your presentation. Many thanks, Rhea, for the wonderful introduction. Thanks for all of you for being here after work, too. I, I know a lot of you have probably had a long day, but uh, Anyong Haseo, I hope I said that right, and uh, great to have you all here. Because I'm a book guy, I brought all the books that I'll be talking about today, too, with me, too. As I was telling Rayo before the presentation, this is one of my favorites, um, Kazu Ishiguro's uh, Claire in the Sun. He's a British writer with a Japanese background. It's one of the best books from 2020 run, and if you, it was the book that kind of inspired my whole project too. And if you haven't read it, um, I definitely recommend it um, too. It'll break your heart, but in a beautiful way and it'll stay with you too. And it's a really moving text. And I've just recently heard actually that Taika Watiti, the uh, Kiwi director is uh, gonna be ad adapting the film too, which is really cool. He's Maori, I think as well. So expect great things. Um, so my research looks at the value and function of narrative, especially why narratives are important. Uh, narratives and storytelling affect the ways in which we think about intelligent systems, technologies in the future. And more importantly, such uh, literary depictions can affect public responses to technology and provide hypothetical models for thinking about the future of these systems too. Um, and on, on an aside too, this is a lovely, uh, just to kind of get you more interested in Claire of the Sun too, this is the Japanese cover of uh, Claire and the Sun too. So I mean, <laughs> I I often judge books by their cover too. So if I see this beautiful <laughs> Japanese cover, I, I would definitely buy this edition too. But I have the kind of boring uh, UK edition, <laughs> but still a great book in other case too. So for me, uh, an intelligent system is a computing system, such as a robot or artificial intelligence that perceive and respond to the world around them. The idea of the intelligent system and its many variations are something that we continue to explore within the research hub of IRIS at the University of Stuttgart. IRIS is an acronym for the Interchange Forum for Reflecting Upon Intelligent Systems. It's an interdisciplinary collaboration between humanity scholars, sociologists, linguists, uh, psychologists, computer scientists, engineers, and more, and aims to explore intelligent systems in its many forms as we become more technologically advanced and immersed as a society. And even today, you know, we're very reliant on technology too. Everyone's always checking their phones, including myself, you know, and we have this wonderful presentation online too. So, you know, we're still very dependent on technology too. It'll probably maybe arguably get more dependent on technology, but these are kind of uh, things to think about too as we go forward with the presentation too. So as Rhea mentioned, my name is Dr. Curtis Renstedler. I'm a, currently a postdoctoral researcher within IRIS. I'm based in the English literature department too, and my research uh, examines literary representations of robots and AI in the 21st century English novel. So I'm really interested in the function of narrative in these novels too. So as I told Rhea before this presentation too, my latest art article is looking at consciousness and uh, mind reading or theory of mind too. So the ability for an individual to kind of put themselves in someone else's mind and uh, AI narratives too. So I'm looking at Claire and the Sun again for that too. Um, so I'm looking at how these narratives of robots and AIs can be used as tools uh, to critically reflect upon intelligent systems. Uh, pointing out not only our shortcomings with technology, but also our relationships to technology between the created and the creator. So my own uh, journey to the 21st century novel has been an exciting uh, trajectory, as you can probably tell from my accent. accent I'm actually not German. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was born in Ottawa, Canada, and completed my bachelor's in English literature at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada, before moving across the pond to complete my master's and PhD in uh, medieval literature at Durham University in Northern England. So I worked at uh, 
place called Mr. Lube in Ottawa, where I did oil changes. And I worked a year and a half there and at a publishing press. And I actually saved enough money to uh, study in the UK too. So I was very lucky. And a fun fact about uh, Durham UK is that they filmed the first Harry Potter film there. Um, I volunteered for years at Durham Cathedral. And as a kind of reward at the end, they actually brought me up to the uh, Triforium where they shot the scene with the Fluffy the three-headed dog. And I actually got to walk through there and <laughs> had to avoid the pigeon shit, but <laughs> it was really, really cool, especially for a geek like me. So um, my master's thesis uh, looked at sympathetic, symp sympathetic werewolves in the medieval romance. And part of it has been published in the journal Gothic Studies. My PhD looked at medieval alchemy and exemplary narratives in 14th and 15th century literature. So I'm a medievalist at heart too, but I, I love all kinds of literature. Um, so I looked at Chaucer to more obscure poems and recipes about uh, alchemy and manuscripts. I was awarded a, uh, so then I worked a year at Ikea and then I did my TESOL certification. And then uh, <laughs> I was awarded a Teach at Tübingen Fellowship in 2019. Uh, before joining the University of Stuttgart's Anglistic Department in 2021. And here we are. So medieval literature is my first love now and forever, uh, but it's exciting to dig into more contemporary literature. Among other publications, so I have my first uh, book out too, which I'll show you a picture of after. I've published a book a chapter on alchemy, queenship, and alchemical commissions for a Game of Thrones critical anthology. That's uh, the one left there, a very lovely cover. And that was a lot of fun to be a part of, too. So they invited uh, Carolyn Larrington, who um, was uh, um, uh, wrote a book on Game of Thrones. And they actually sent the uh, manuscript to George R. R. Martin. But as with many things, he, I don't know if he's read that either. So he hasn't been writing, he hasn't been reading. But anyway, um, still kind of cool. And I also wrote an article for Public Medievalist on uh, cultural hybridity masks and no theater in Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, one of my favorite video games. And I just wrote a book chapter on uh, vampire priests and cult messiahs in Stephen King's Salem's Lot uh, for a critical anthology on theology and vampires that's forthcoming. Uh, my current research with Iris argues that uh, robot uh, AI narratives also function as simulation tools for better understanding and critically reflecting upon intelligent systems. Uh, my research bridges uh, literary narratives with simulation technology to explore the interactions and interrelationships between humans and robots in the 21st century English novel. This focus stems from a recent surge in literary narratives exploring ethical issues such as the relationship between humans and robots and AI and the ways we sh in which we should treat robots and AI in our everyday lives. Um, and that's up to debate too because there's a whole new thing of the ethics of treating AI or you know should we treat them with the same rights or um, you know how should we think about Roombas? What's the difference between a Roomba and um, an advanced AI like Clara? So I argue that uh, such narratives offer simulations and even models through which readers can reflect upon and improve our interactions with robotic AI technology, as well as to learn to better understand and live with them. So here are some uh, books that I've been uh, looking at for my project too. Uh, most recently, I, I've been reading um, um, Saying Goodbye to, to Yang in um, Alexander Weinstein's Children of the New World. I'm giving a conference paper on that and race. Uh, so. Um, looking at anti uh, anti Asian American uh, racism and also um, uh, the whiteness of AI, and that's for a conference in Estonia, which is coming up in the following months too. And uh, Claire in the Sun, which I mentioned, um, also Ian McEwan's Machines Like Me. I didn't like that one as much as Claire in the Sun, but there's a kind of a little bit of overlap uh, between those two texts too. So Claire in the Sun, you have the point of view of uh, robot narrator Clara. Clara. Uh, in Ian McEwan's Machines Like Me, you have this alternative 80s, 1980s setting, and the main, the story is told from the point of view of a robot enthusiast who is a human, uh, but he lives with this uh, uh, robot called Adam, and uh, Adam kind of appears in the text as a black box. You don't really know what's going on in his head, too, but as we go through the story, um, he kind of forms a relationship with um, the main character's girlfriend too, and it causes this bizarre love triangle, and it's really interesting too. And Alan Turing, in this alternate '80s, is actually still alive, so he's head of this kind of robotics institute too. And uh, it's really a shame what happened to Alan Turing. So Alan Turing was the uh, leading figure b behind computing as we know it today too. So he came up with the uh, um, the Turing test, which is a way to to gauge kind of how human-like machines are. I'm also looking at Jeanette Winterson's Frankenstein too, which uh, features some uh, sex spots too. Um, Jeanette Winterson also has a really good companion piece called 12 Bites. It's like a pun. So 
bytes is in biting, but also bytes is in uh, computer information. And um, there's a kind of an ethical debate about, you know, uh, whether sex bots can um, help, you know, issues of incel dumb uh, too, which is a really growing issue. Um, I I don't think it's possible. And Jeanette Wenderson is also very against the idea. She kind of makes fun of the idea that it's a solution in the novel too. Um, but anyway, too, because, <laughs> you know, even if even if incels are having sex, it doesn't kill the problem of misogyny. And I also um, am looking at uh, Annalie Newitz's uh, Autonomous, which I came to kind of more recently too. And this is a really cool book. I always call it kind of, um, um, what do you call it? William Gibson's Neuromancer on math in a good way, because <laughs> there's so much going on too. And there's queer robots and there's, uh, you know, it, a lot of it takes place in Canada too, in, in the Northern Territories, but they're kind of more kind of warmer. Um, and the author is non-binary too. She writes, or they write for um, a lot of different scientific publications too. So they're very informed about what they write about. And uh, I don't have it on this list too, but I've actually started, I actually read recently uh, Maurice, Marissa Meyer's uh, Cinder too, which is another great book. Uh, I just love showing off my books. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is kind of a, um, I guess not really steampunk, but it's kind of a sci-fi retelling of the story of Cinderella too. And it's kind of a more feminist take on it too. Um, so the main character, she's, she's kind of this, uh, robot mechanic which is really cool she's like a cyborg mechanic and obviously there's a lot of distrust from her family too she has the awful stepmother and stepsisters too but you know the prince, prince is interested in her um really cool really feminist approach i don't know she probably doesn't even need a man in the story but i mean it's still really good anyways and i thought it was gonna be like twilight marissa meyer but you know marissa meyer is actually really great so if you need more summer reads that's definitely a good one and that's one i'm kind of looking at more for research um too um, so I really recommend uh, Claire and the Sun too, in case you know I haven't recommended it enough already too. Um, but in either case, all these narratives kind of examine human uh, robot social interactions, the, the theme of trust, um, societal fears of being replaced or being made redundant with technology uh, as, in, um, as we become more industrialized as a society too. A lot of concerns too. So even if you go to like um, the supermarket in North America, for example, too, there's a lot of, I don't know what it's like in Korea, it's probably even more advanced, but um, in North America too, there's a lot of people who don't like using the, the self-automated checkouts too. They feel like a lot of the cashiers are becoming more redundant too. So um, yeah, it kind of taps into a lot, some of these ideas too. There's also cultural anxieties about living with uh, rapidly developing technology too. So can we trust these machines that we're living with too? To what extent can we get have them take care of our families too? Um, in Frankenstein, for example, the Jeanette Winterson book, uh, the transhuman protagonist Rai Shelley lives in a future where they must deal with the social challenges of normalizing their existence as both human and machine too. Um, consequently, these narratives enable the reader to engage with scenarios or story worlds to simulate social outcomes of technology and investigate problems or potential gray areas for current shortcomings of aut modern automation, such as their potential compliancy, uh, attentional differences, and lack of understanding in terms of relationships with humans. My projects uh, focus uh, on the ethical and social concerns of robots and AI in the 21st century novel, assesses contemporary fears, anxieties, and emerging uncertainties with technological innovation in the field of intelligent systems. Such ethical concerns include the theme of acceptance as well. So with these new technologies being developed across different sectors, how can we as scientists and interdisciplinary scholars ensure that these robots AI are accepted in society? Ishiguro's Clara exemplifies the ethical concern of not being wholly accepted within her society since she is, uh, spoiler alert, um, ultimately disposed of and ends up in a landfill at the end of Claire and the Sun too. And similarly in uh, Machines Like Me, and I'm sorry, this is a spoiler again, but at the end of Machines Like Me, um, the main character and his girlfriend decide to destroy Adam too and actually come under a lot of heat from it from Alan Turing himself. And he has this beautiful monologue at the end where he kind of shames them for uh, destroying um, Ian McEwen or the uh, Adam, the robot. So why literature too? So reading these literary narratives as models for simulation and story worlds or world making 
also enables the reader to predict and explain both human and robotic behavior within these social contexts. And that's what the more recent research that I mentioned on, on mind reading and theory of mind comes into play. So in addition, such scenarios encourage empathetic growth, as shown, for instance, in the case of Ishiguro's Clara, Clara since the story is told in first-person narrative, and this exposes the reader to the robot's intimate thoughts and emotions, which are arguably more human throughout the novel than her human surrogate family too. And something else with Clara too is that she's often kind of um, putting, prioritizing the, the child in her life too. So the child that she looks after, Josie, she's always prioritizing herself too. So there's this idea of self-sacrifice too. Sacrifice to the extent that she kind of prioritizes others above her own needs too. And because she's a machine, you know, a lot of times there's this kind of stigma or prejudice that she doesn't have uh, those kind of human feelings too. Um, but as we see through her narrative, too, her feelings are quite genuine, too, even though she doesn't always understand uh, the needs of the family. Uh, while Clara's existence as an artificial friend, as she's called in the novel, initially seems alien to the reader, the shared experiences of reading the narrative acts as a catalyst for empathizing and identifying with robots and AI. In other words, such narratives help to understand human behavior and its underlying cognitions, and in Clara's case, applying narrative and legalistic strategies that foster empathy too. Uh, so for example, theory of mind. Uh, of course, most of us have impressions, thoughts, and ideas about robots and AI in popular culture today. We've all seen films or TV series depicting machines or read a Philip K. Dick or Isaac Asimov novel. Um, these narratives form our initial impressions of intelligent systems, how we think about them more broadly, and perhaps reflect our own concerns or understandings about them. The image of the modern robot is embedded in contemporary science fiction, literature, and popular culture. We also have uh, a lot of machines appearing in speculative fiction too, in postmodern literature. So they're not just limited to science fiction, but the majority of kind of robotic depictions are in science fiction too. Here's a fun little joke to uh, from Blade Runner. Let me tell you about my mother from the opening scene. She's a very special lady and I love her very much. I love my mother, <laughs> but kind of a fun joke. Um, so in Ridley Scott's classic Blade Runner and its sequel, uh, Blade Runner 2049, which came out more recently, um, the first of which is based on Philip K. Dick's uh, short story novella, uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? And this was published in 1968. The main character, Deckard, is a blade runner. So he's a special force police officer tasked with essentially terminating replicants that is artificially created humans who have gone rogue. Um, the films and novella reveal that not only do the replicants likely dream of electric sheep, so it, it kind of answers Philip K. Dick's rhetorical question, but they have evidence of human consciousness and they're capable of feelings, emotion, and empathy. A lot of uh, people who have watched the films, who are really into the films, they also suggest that Deckard, the Harrison Ford's character, is actually a replicant too, but that's kind of ambiguous too. Um, the very title, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, launches a discussion of what it means to be human and robotic, where the boundaries lie and the extent of robotic consciousness, or if robots can in fact be conscious. When does a replicant or android or homunculus, so that's a lab-grown human in medieval and early modern literature, reach the threshold in which it is considered uh, acceptably human, and how should ethics be recalibrated and reorganized in consideration of android rights and well-being? And you know, should that ha in fact happen? So uh, um, on the other side of the spectrum is uh, the Terminator model infamously played by Arnold Schwarzenegger in James Cameron's 1984 film, The Terminator. The mach machines of the future send the Terminator back in time to 1984, good year apparently, uh, from a dystopian future where machines have turned on humans and wiped out most of it. But I think, you know, as you dig more into lore, I think it's the humans fault that the AI turned on them too. The Terminator is tasked with killing Sarah Connor, the mother of John Connor, who leads the human resistance against the machines in the post-apocalyptic future. And if you've seen the new films, you know that the, the series keeps going, you know, despite what happens. Um, the Terminator is a relentless pursuer and hunter, tracking and killing Sarah's roommates, friends, lover, mother, and most of the police department for, before she terminates it at the end of the film. As her... Um, Human protector from the future, Kyle Reese tells her, and I'll do my, my best Michael Bean impression, it can't be bargained with, it can't be reasoned with, it doesn't feel pity or remorse or fear, and it absolutely will not stop until you are dead. So that's my Michael Bean impression. <laughs> uh, the Terminator is the antithesis of the empathy and compassion of the replicants, a cold mechanical killing machine. 
It also reflects cultural and societal anxieties of the robot. This is very much a robot that can threaten and even kill you. And it must be destroyed so that humanity can literally procreate in this case. And uh, Sarah Birthing John suggests this. Its setting is 1984 LA in the midst of Cold War nuclear fears and the dr draconian policies of the Ronald Reagan government and neoconservatism suggests a more techno-pessimistic future, one in which robot humans must actively fight to prevent the fears of machine takeover and human subordination or annihilation. These fears are also reflected in the sequel, um, Terminator 2 Judgment Day from 1991, in which Sarah, John, and a re reprogrammed Terminator model tried to prevent Skynet from seemingly inevitably, as the series suggests, triggering the human machine war in Judgment Day. The opening scene featuring a nightmarish sequence in which LA is destroyed via an atomic bomb and the antagonistic T-1000 model survives through the flames. Um, so here we have, in the top right, we have the corner of the, of the nightmare scenario. It's the worst nightmare for technophobes, and this is a uh, Greek for fear of technology and techno pessimists, revealing a future without gods, humanities, and history too. And there's that scene after the bomb goes off where the uh, you see the T1000 step on a human skull and it just obliterates the the skull too. So suggesting that there is no kind of history here, as the atomic waste shows us, there aren't even skeletons left to remember the dead. Yet in this film. Uh, Schwarzenegger's T-800 model also displays humanity through his interactions with John, with whom he acts as not only protector, but also as a surrogate father. And indeed, this relationship is central to our empathy or sympathy for him as a protagonist, uh, protecting John and Sarah from the bad robot, the T-1000. And it's a challenge to watch the final few minutes of the film and not feel pain and empathy. And at the end, he says, I now know why you cry, but it's something I can never do. As he sacrifices himself by lowering himself into a pit of molten metal, embodying a sort of, um, I have kind of a phrase for this kind of idea, it's called the magical cyborg, and this comes from Spike Lee's idea of the magical negro, but in this case, uh, the magical cyborg is this kind of reconfigured machine who gives up everything for the betterment of humans. We see ourselves also in the T-800 model, or we want to see ourselves in the T-800 model, and we have seen John and the model's relationship grow and develop as the movie progresses, so it feels only natural to cry. Yet the robot is still limited by his programming, and though he has developed near human feeling and emotions, he is still a machine. And humans are always very keen to kind of project themselves onto machines, too, to anthropomorphize uh, things for better and for worse, too. More recently in... Uh, Alex Garland's uh, 2014 film, Ex Machina, which is also excellent. Uh, Alicia Vikander plays Ava, the creation of a bodybuilding, beer-drinking bro, tech billionaire CEO, uh, Nathan Bateman, played by o Oscar Isaac, too. And just one thing I wanted to bring up, too, is this film also kind of showcases the enduring problem of the whiteness of AI, too. So we see here, too, how you know all these depictions of AI, Schwarzenegger, it's big Austrian guy, uh, Alicia Vikander, this beautiful Swedish actress, uh, they're all kind of portrayed as white too. So there's kind of this whiteness of AI that's an enduring problem. Um, in the film, uh, Bateman is symbolic of toxic masculinity and bro culture and very much represents a Frankenstein-like creator whose hubris prevents his creation from having her own autonomy or sense of liberation and freedom. Through her interactions with one of the company programmers, Caleb Smith, played by Domino Gleason, however, she not only passes the Turing test with flying colors, but she also turns against her creator and strategizes and plans her escape. The feminist undertones of the film are supported by her own uh, autonomy and liberation as a female robot and the rejection of the toxic nice guy persona that Caleb exudes when she leaves him at the end to asserting newfound independence as she escapes to and hopefully integrates with society. She don't need no man. <laughs> of course, these examples are just some of many. The robot uh, appears increasingly across literature and film. But these depictions also suggest our own complex and sometimes ambivalent connections with the robot. We admire Schwarzenegger's T-800 model and Alicia uh, Vikander's Ava because they remind us of our humanness. Whereas the horror of Skynet and the T-1000 and the original Terminator lies in the fact that is very uh, remains very inhuman, sterile, and devoid of life too. So human think all, humans always think in binaries because it's convenient, right? But we know as life experiences, you know, things aren't limited to dichotomies to you know gender kind of uh, representations of robots too. So um, it's more kind of food for thought. The future of AI and robots in literature and film remains 
um, ambiguous, although we have seen kind of some progressiveness if we look at Westworld, which I'll also talk about, um, you know, we have seen kind of seen you know, more diversity in terms of AI representations too. Um, Star Trek, for example, suggests more optimistic and utopian possibilities, such as the holographic doctor in Voyager and data in the next generation. So yeah, it kind of gives us some ideas about thinking ahead with the future too. So I'm a techno optimist and more aligned with the hope, more hopeful possibilities of Star Trek or even Isaac Asimov's novels. Uh, so Isaac Asimov, as you may know, is famous for proposing the three laws of robotics too. I do, however, recognize concerns with the advancement of technology, but not for the usual rec reasons. So in Clara and the Sun, for instance, Clara's problem is that she is too compliant and the people around her exploit and take advantage of her kindness and willingness to serve. So we have that kind of scenario, the opposite scenario of this technophobic Skynet uh, uprising. In the recent HBO TV series Westworld, we also see a similar sort of compliancy with the intelligence systems. The Android hosts, such as Laura's uh, featured on the left here, played by Evan Rachel Wood, or uh, uh, another the other character featured on the right here, I forget her name, <laughs> are often destroyed or treated as expendable commodities in the Westworld park because they can be reconstructed or repaired in the laboratory. The deaths or mutilations of such androids become commodifiable for a paying audience. So the characters in the film, you know, they can pay twenty dollars and, you know, shoot uh, Evan Rachel Wood's character in the head and then just rebuild her too, which is problematic for many reasons. But uh, um, you know, rather than intelligent sentient beings, androids are effectively sold as objects, means of capital for producing greater profit. And we see this also in in the the literature too. So in Claire and the Sun, Clara is similarly commodified. Ishiguro writes, each of us had been promised our turn and each of us longed for it to come. That was partly to do with what manager called the special honor of representing the store to the outside. So that's uh, on page five of the book. Clara is an artificial friend that is a solar powered robot that is sold for uh, profit under the guise of supporting a family. Clara's attentiveness is a key marketable feature of her robotic model, and her manager exploits this feature as a means of selling her, relegating the artificial friend to the role of commodifiable robot or object. The artificial friends are also put in the shop window to catch the attention of prospective buyers intending to attract their, their attention with the model's features and novelty. Her human manager blatantly lies to the artificial friends. They are not chosen, but sold commercially for profit. They are clearly marketable goods, but the manager gives them the illusion that they should be honored to be chosen. So in this way, the manager manipulates Claire and the other artificial friends because they are overly trusting, and that's due to their programming, but also the way they are conditioned in the store to follow a certain protocol. The problem with the artificial friends is not that they are, not only that they are too compliant, uh, or sorry, the problem with the artificial friends is that they're too compliant. They're not actively planning, as I said, a Skynet robot apocalypse, but rather they're too passive and consequently get exploited and taken advantage of by by humans as a result too. And there's some really interesting parallels in uh, recent scholarship too. There's um, a lot of uh, black scholars uh, to draw kind of parallels between the history of slavery and the history of robotics too. And if you think about the word robot too, it comes from the Ch Czech word meaning forced labor uh, too. So that's from uh, Carol Chapik's 1922 play, Rosem's Universal Robots. Um, so uh, manager doesn't care about their, their existence or well-being after they've been sold as long as they're turning a profit too. And there's this heartbreaking scene at the end of Clara's son. Sorry, I'm spoiling it again. But um, where you know she has this interaction with Clara, she's kind of rotting away at the landfill too. And uh, the manager walks off to and Clara kind of expects her to look back at her, you know, one last parting glance. But instead, you know, the manager's looking at a crane to which says all you really need to know about how, you know, she's being treated in this this book. Uh, in the following passage, Clara meets with the human mother of her host family to discuss uh, Josie, who is terminally ill. Clara is being groomed to replace her if she dies. I'll read it out here, too. Um, oh, I think I got the wrong slide here. Here we go. Um, it must be nice sometimes to have no feelings. I envy you. And then Clara says, I believe I have many feelings. The more I observe, the more feelings become available to me on pages 97 and 98. So Ishiguro provides the reader with Clara's first person narrative to show how wrong the mother is. The reader has seen throughout that Clara is indeed capable of showing, showing true emotion and feeling and that she is often more sympathetic, human and sympathetic than the real humans in her life. 
there's numerous inference uh, instances too where Clara's becomes worried, you know, where she gets scared too. So she experiences a full range of emotions too. And because we're seeing it from that first person point of view too, it drives home kind of that um, theory that she is in fact conscious. Um, Clara is uh, programmed to feel and show emotion, but as she says, her emotional palette uh, expands and grows as she experiences more of the world. So like in, as with machine learning too, which are programmed by data sets too, she's, uh, she collects data sets from her observations of the world too. She's, she's very acutely aware of her physical surroundings too, uh, too, and that kind of builds her kind of AI repository too as it goes on too. So she becomes more intelligent as she gathers more data about the world too. But it's an interesting way of data collection too. And in the novel too, we also see that she... Um, uh, interprets the world through kind of boxes too. So when she sees people, she sees them in boxes too, which is really interesting. Uh, the mother has a limited and superficial understanding of technology and Clara's programming and functions, later claiming that it's not your business to be curious on page 103. Clara does not meet her cookie cutter expectations of what such technology should be. She reacts with anger and repulsion when these expectations are subverted. And her reactions are akin to what Japanese roboticist Masahiro Miro calls the uncanny valley. And that is a technophobic revulsion to the human becoming too human. So in this uh, passage from Jeanette Winterson's Frankenstein, a sex bot entrepreneur named Ron Lord brings one of his sex bots, Claire, to a university talk as part of a demonstration. Ron shoulders his way through the crowd like he's his own bouncer at his own nightclub. He picks up the bag, lays it on the cloakroom counter and unzips it. Out comes a sex doll folded in half. Her denim jacket is Claire written on it in sequins. Daddy, says Claire, I don't know how she got set off, says Ron. She's controlled by an app. What is this thing, asks the security guard. She's a sex bot, says Ron. The prof asked me to bring her to the talk in case anybody wanted to see one. Wait a sec. She needs unfolding. Ron pulls down Claire's legs one at a time. Open my, deg my legs, Daddy. Wider. Uh, embarrassed giggles. Horrors. Oh my God. Yikes. This cannot be for real. Yuck. Cool. Let me see that. That's on page uh, 66 and 67 of Frankenstein. So in this book, uh, Winterson critiques the sex bot industry and the people within it. Um, there's an argument that sex bots can curb the sexual frustrations and inadequacies of incels, for example, but it does not kill misogyny. And that is something that Winterson actively critiques as well. In this sense, instance, the sex bot is purposely fully gendered and sexually commodified. The audience's diverse and often contradictory responses to her appearance are a microcosm for society's reaction to the sexual robot, at once fascinated, disgusted, horrified, and intrigued, and probably sharing it on you know, Instagram or something too. Uh, Claire's relationship with the consumer is literally based on control, used through the app, and submissiveness, the father-daughter sexual incest taboo. At the same time, she's out of control with Ron uncertain about how she was activated unless it is an act. She is presented as a spectacle, an artifact for the modern world for everyone to see. Ron markets her body here as part of that spectacle, using her readily available sexuality to create an audience and generate interest in his product. So that's a little taste of some of the kind of books I'm getting at and kind of the representations that we see today in uh, both film and literature in terms of robots and AI too. And obviously I think it is worth pointing out too that uh, the advanced AI that we see in um, in a lot of these representations is a far cry from what's actually happening too. So a lot of the uh, AI that's taking place today is based on machine learning. Well, it is, it's all based on machine learning, but um, <laughs> um, you know the most advanced AI that we have is nothing compared to what we see in Claire in the Sun, for example, too. And uh, some of the feedback I got from my project was, uh, you know, maybe you could look at, uh, you know, less advanced AI. And I mean, that would be really interesting, but I mean, if there's any Roomba AI narratives, I I would love to hear about it, but it would probably all be in binary code. So um, these, these kind of narratives gives, are kind of useful for kind of raising discussions about the future of AI discussions that we'll have to have, even if AI doesn't become as advanced as um, Clara, I think OpenAI recently announced with ChatGPT4, um, you know, there was, they want to kind of advance the AI as, as much as possible too. And there's no kind of ethical or AI compliance considerations with it too. They just want to get it out as soon as possible. And there are a lot of questions ethically, socially, uh, kind of philosophically that we have to think about when we do this too. And I think um, AI narratives are useful ways of, of interrogating these issues too. 
So while my current position is research-based, I did give a presentation and prepared group work for the uh, University of Stuttgart's School for Talent uh, in summer 2022. This is an interdisciplinary program for exceptionally gifted students. In groups, I had them think about AI narratives as well as their expectations and assumptions about AI technology in reality and in popular culture. I also organized a cyber story contest about AI and featured the winning contributions on the website too. Really exciting. So the winner of the, the cyber story contact, contest wasn't actually a humanities scholar. He was actually a Loth scholar from Hong Kong, uh, which is really cool. It's a beautiful short story he wrote. And I said, you know, you should actually try and publish it. And I, I haven't had much luck personally with publishing short stories, but um, it was a really, I think he wrote a few more short stories too. Um, I was also invited to give seminars on my research with the MA uh, English students at the university. We started off by talking about technophobia um, in the 20th, 20th century. We looked at uh, Isaac Asimov's short story, Robbie, and Ray Bradbury's short story, The Velt, before diving into Clara and the Sun and uh, Machines Like Me for class number two. So uh, this is just a taster, but as we can see, these literary narratives are extremely useful for acting as tools for re reflecting upon intelligent systems. Through these narratives, we can explore our fears, anxieties, and ambitions of technology. With such robots and AI as hypothetical models, we can also reflect upon our own shortcomings of speciesism, gender inequality, race, social class issues, political alignments, and more. Creativity is a spark or a catalyst that can affect these changes, enabling us to work together for a better understanding between humans and intelligent systems. Um, so I think the way forward with you know working with robots is collaboration too. So you know when we have things like concerns with people being feeling redundant at stores and that sort of things, the way is not to kind of get rid of the workers, but the ways to work together with workers. So collaborative AI, I think is the way of the future. And it's a good way forward for thinking about um, how we, we interpret and interact with AI to rather than kind of fear it. Um, whether we like it or not, robots and AI will continue to emerge and develop. There are some theories that we will eventually emerge with technology in a singularity. That's uh, Ray Kurzweil's opinion. But in the meantime, I think it's more important to think about how we share our space with intelligent systems in our household, in our social lives around us, the robot butler in that cute Korean cafe, maybe, uh, and to program those these technologies with our best human impulses. So I have some kind of research questions too, but what can literary narratives do for us and how can they inform science, our future and, and vice versa? But I'd also like to say, oh, if I don't, I don't my cute slide at the end, but yes, my presentation, thank you. <laughs> um, bravo, thank you. Round of applause, I, cyber applause. I, I don't have, uh, I have some, re uh, at going forward too, I don't know if we want to do a question period or if it, I have some questions too for the audience too, uh, <laughs> whatever you like. We have some time. So why don't you bring your questions up? And if our audience has questions, they can feel free to just speak them out. We're a small group. I'm checking the chat to see if anything was dropped. Or... There's lots of comments by Red that are entertaining. Thanks for all your comments, Rhett. He disappeared for class, but he was in and out. Yeah. So what are your questions, Curtis? Uh, so my questions is when you think of kind of robots and technology, what do you what comes to mind too? Do you have a more utopian view or more dystopian or more kind of realistic or what what are your thoughts? Mm. Anyone want to pipe up? Sure. Oh, Annika, you first. Oh, oh, okay, thanks. Um, so, yeah, growing up, like you watch all the movies, like you know, Terminator Two and um, was it Two Thousand One Space Odyssey, and you have like these ideas of robots and whatnot. Freaking and, hell! <laughs> yeah, hell, and, and how how scary it could possibly be? And then now I look at the reality of it, like like using Chat GPT. I'm like, oh, or like somebody's got their little Roomba going around. I'm like, okay, well, we don't quite have to worry yet. It's not <laughs> there yet. Yeah. But it's interesting to see like um, the panic that happens around it whenever there's an update around technology or there's something that's going to change the, uh, the landscape of our lives and how things uh, get drawn a lot of attention there. Um, 
So are you finding that there's a, like just more literature in general about robots and AI or has that just always been happening? I mean, I'm yeah, sure it's, it's always happening, but is there just more in general now? I think so. Yeah, I think, well, we live in an age too, where if you look at the last 10 years and everyone's attention spans to how those have kind of <laughs> really changed too. And I think there's an interesting relationship between attention and, and kind of the proliferation of, of, uh, of, of the writer's contributions. Everyone's writing nowadays, everyone with a kind of phone or, or kind of a computer is writing. So we have more people writing than ever before too. I mean, it's not always good stuff that's being produced too, but I think, uh, you know, just because it's so more increasingly familiar in our own lives, everyday lives, I think everyone has their kind of own two cents of technology, which which can be problematic to a lot of people too. You know, we live in an unprecedented area too, you know, with ChatGPT and, and other things, kind of Roombas being everywhere too. And, and not a lot of people um, fully understand the technologies too. And a lot of, not a lot of people also fully understand that, you know, we're not quite in that stage where we have advanced AI. It's still a long ways away to, I mean, when people think of AI, they think of like the Terminator too. And I mean, that can be quite problematic too, thinking of it in terms of good and bad um, too, where, when really it's a lot more machine learning too, you know, with more algorithms at this stage than anything too. And there is a big jump between, um, you know, the machine learning that we say today and advanced AI too. And that's something that the computer scientists are always reminding me of my research too. They're like, oh, you know, we're not quite there yet. And I'm like, well, you know, maybe someday. <laughs> but um, I mean, there is reason, cause for co concern too. As I said, I'm a techno-optimist. So I try to see the good side of things. But I, I know that we live in this era where it's unprecedented. A lot of people feel like their jobs are being threatened. It's not necessarily a Luddite response. I think their, their feelings are genuine too. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's that's why it's important to focus more on kind of collaborative AI or cooperative AI um, in that sense. Great question, R response. <laughs> well, recently I hear people talking about the Samsung earbuds that do simultaneous translation and, and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And they're worried about the future of language um, teaching as well. Yeah. Uh, I think it's really interesting when you look at movies like Her with Joaquin Phoenix and the thought of yes, Jones, artificial yeah. intelligence developing a personality and emotions that people interact with. And I don't know. Yeah, and it's all, I don't think it's, it's also impossible. In, it's interesting with that film too, because it's very sexualized, right? You know, when you have a, the robot, it's always like a very sex, it's Scarlett Johansson, the sexy voice, you know, too. So there's always kind of a, I think it's a human way of kind of, they always gender robots too, which is really interesting in that regard. Uh, as well too but yeah i mean there's a lot of concerns even if you look at kind of uh, google translate how it how they, they've kind of upgraded the the software in the last 10 years too i mean it used to be really shit but now you can you know the sneaky latin student can go on there and translate their homework or their korean homework too and we don't want that right? so um that's the challenge i think if, it poses for a lot of you know language um teachers and professors as well too so it's Definitely. very concerning to yeah. the software available to the free software too you know you can do any course now even with duolingo it's pretty competent even if you're learning kind of a few words a week too so uh, it calls into question the future of, of of education in this way too you know how we'll be moving forward how can we implement new strategies to kind of uh, you know make make our our our, <laughs> our research you know first and foremost um yeah well, in 21st century skills in education, it's emphasizing what only humans can do rather than, you know, stuff that can be automatized. So it's definitely under discussion often. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Lots of discussions about chat TPT too, you know, like, well, I mean, and we've, we've all had those discussions, I guess, already at the department meetings and things, but, you know, concerns about, uh, you know, recognizing it too, you know, uh, also, in terms of art production, too, can, you know, ChatGPT produce a better Stephen King novel than Stephen King? You know, maybe not. But, um, I mean, what's the difference? You know, can can we spot the difference? And I think that's that's worrying, too, this kind of unvan uncanny value when it becomes too human, too. And then what makes it human, too, in the first place, too? That's something that's still, um, up, you know, under investigation, I guess. Yeah, I think it's got a ways to go to mimic Stephen King. Yeah. <laughs> However, in the visual art world, a lot of artists are concerned because people will see stuff and they're not always able to discern unless it's got like seven fingers, yeah. if it was made by well, a human or not. 
I heard this wonderful um it was a it was called Aisis and uh it was this band that kind of played songs and the band was okay but then they 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 just really liked Oasis so they changed the the lead singer's voice so it sounded like Liam Gallagher you know in the 90s and it actually sounded as good as the stuff that Oasis had put out in the 90s and no joke and they had a whole albums worth of stuff and they didn't weren't trying to capitalize on it they just did it as more of an experiment but it was actually kind of uncanny just how much like Liam Gallagher uh, it was like, and, you know, reading through a lot of the comments, you know, they were, a lot of people were quite terrified. They were worried about, you know, auth authenticity and that sort of thing too. Liam Gallagher spoke up about it. He said, oh, that's really cool. These songs sound really good. But a lot of people, they kind of had, you know, kind of a frightened reaction. I know um, another artist, uh, Nick Cave, uh, he had a very kind of strong response to uh, AI. I wrote an article recently where I was kind of a little bit hard on him. But to be fair, he was also kind of dealing with the grief of losing a child. But he was saying, you know, AI is incapable of true emotions, of dealing with grief, of experiencing grief. So how can it replicate that experience? Which, you know, I was very hard on him. my article, maybe too hard on him. But um, I think those are genuine questions, too. And I think Nick Cave, is always, he has a, a website called The Red Letter Files. And he always has very kind of rich uh, feedback when people ask him questions so yeah Monica well thanks for the uh, art, uh, article in Frankenstein yeah that, that's always really interesting too yeah because that's kind of really coming out especially in um, South Korea and it's not only incels too with sex spots um, the yeah. concern well, it's too it's not is... about Frankenstein but it's yeah. about like <laughs> it's in the context of sex it. dolls <laughs> yeah <laughs> It's like, yeah, think, that exactly points out the misogyny, even though people are like, but it's a doll. Like, yeah, but it's especially like... Especially something you know, inanimate that can't act back. <laughs> exactly. There's a huge like feminist uh, movement, actually, that's kind of against uh, uh, the kind of advancement of, of sex bots. But I mean, the problem is too, like with most AI technology, whether we like it or not, it is coming to. And the problem too is it's a lot of, you know, often a lot of them, you know, they're a lot of them, the customers are kind of, old, you know, men who are quite lonely too, and not necessarily misogynistic, but I mean, the concept can be read as quite misogynistic, I think too. Um, what's also interesting too, is that uh, there is, there are kind of uh, uh, male sex dolls on the market too, but the problem is, is, you know, with the kind of anatomy of the kind of uh, uh, cisgendered male is, you know, that they're, they're a little bit more difficult for a, uh, for a sex, I think. So it's easier for a lot of uh, manufacturers and also with supply and demand to make the female sex dolls too. Uh, but yeah, it is really horrific, you know, to think about a lot of the, how these sex dolls are treated, even if they're well seen as inanimate objects too, you know, how, how is this translating to real world skills? Uh, how is this a translating to their relationship with women? Does it affect relationship with women in any way? And as we know too, you know, like, uh, we we still live in a very kind of, in my opinion, patriarchal world too, you know, in South Korea, in Germany. Um, and this is helping advance women's rights too, which I think is the priority. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for this article. I'll give it a read. <laughs> I think the antidote to, I like the words techno-optimist, techno-pessimist. I think I'm a techno-optimist, yeah. <laughs> but I think the antidote to the ails of techno-pessimism is enhancing emotional intelligence and understanding it's not an individual intelligence alone it is a cultural intelligence and we, we yeah. have a lot of work to do and i think that's really important too because you know i think that's why education is so important tessel you know like um because i think we're that kind of gap between you know the kind of luddite responses to and our duty is to kind of inform the public and educate the public about you know maybe maybe this type of technology isn't all that bad you know maybe it's not all deep fake and <laughs> you know sex spots you know there's actually things that we can benefit from you know chat gpt is as giving us creative prompts not writing our essay but giving us creative prompts to kind of think about certain topics too um so you know seeing it as a sort of wikipedia in some ways um and that might be kind of helpful too so i think that, that's where the role of education is so important and so prominent as well i don't think i knew that robot was from a czech word and that it is derived yeah, from the meaning of it's, uh, forced labor. But I've always I did not, dreamed of the well, days sorry. that robots can do all the boring work that we don't want to do, and we can just enjoy being humans and explore well, consciousness would be pretty awesome. It's a beautiful short story. I think I have it, or it's a beautiful play, actually, and it's told in a, in a couple, I think it's three acts, and it's from 1922, and it's actually kind of a Marxist kind of allegory, uh, so really interesting Marxist roots. So when you think of the evolution of the fictional robot how it's really changed since um carol chapik's play 
1922 Rosam's Universal Robots. That's the name of the play. Uh, really great too. So you have these kind of uh, unscrupulous uh, managers running this factory too, and they want to produce more manpower. They want to produce more goods. So they develop these team of superhumans and they're not really robots in the sense that we think of, you know, with the metal parts, they're more like the replicants in Blade Runner too. So they they're kind of basically superhumans. And of course they exploit the, the superhumans too. And what happens is the superhumans, right? The, the uh, proletariats, they rise up against the bourgeoisie, the, the greedy unscrupulous managers, and they actually overthrow humanity too. Um, but they keep a couple of them around, I think. Um, really, really beautiful play, actually. Really has still has a lot of power, too. And it's interesting just going back to this play, you know, and the idea of robot as forced labor, um, how that's kind of reflected today, and actually how the meaning of the original robot has really kind of moved away from um, the play. Uh, Andrea, Andrea has, has a question. A question. Uh, yeah, sorry, it's a little bit off topic at the moment, but I was curious, you mentioned... Uh, Iris, I think the organization. Yes. Um, so I was wondering, because like, you were talking about intelligence and consciousness, and I was wondering how you guys define that. Yeah, so we have a long, I think we have a long definition of intelligent systems on the website too. Uh, I think for intelligent systems, this is my definition, but um, I defined it as a kind of computing system uh, that perceive and respond to the world around them too. I think they have a definition on their website too. I'm not sure what it is offhand too. Consciousness is kind of a little bit more murkier too, because there's a lot of philosophical arguments uh, too that you know robots are incapable of of being conscious uh, as well too. But in uh, a lot of the kind of fiction, we do see these kind of uh, uh, robots such as Clara. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a good working definition for it at all too. I'm still kind of grappling with the psychological definitions of it to find a good uh, reading because obviously our idea of human consciousness is different than what we see in uh you know uh, socially imagined ai consciousness too but that's, it's a great question yeah too if i have one too i'll i'll, I'll let you know too how that develops because i mean i'm a big asimov fan as well and and i i recently reread i robot no i recently read i robot from him oh it's great eh? yeah yeah it's awesome because he really foresees i mean where we're going i think um yeah but yeah, but I mean, like you said, at the moment, AI AI is not, the AI that we have is not intelligent at all. So when I was, because the, the, the topic of the talk was the value of reading AI narratives. But while I was listening to you, it, it sounds to me more like what we're doing is like we're reflecting off of, ro off of robots or, or artificial intelligence, basically parts of us that we that we see and maybe are afraid of and don't like. So yeah. I mean I'm also a Philip K. Dick fan and and, and all the, um, the the movies based on that. So it's it's been a an interest of mine for a long time. So one one of the things that I'm curious about is that the the our intelligence how it's possible that that might might actually become um, like like at the moment it's organically based. It might might become silicon based if if AI actually develops in that direction. So to me that that's what's interesting. So maybe the silicon based intelligence or consciousness if you can get get around to defining it might might actually be a continuation of our intelligence so i find that interesting yeah yeah kind of like an extended phenotype in a way too if we look at like think about richard dawkins idea the extended phenotype where we have the phenotype is not just limited to ourselves too but you know technology is kind of an extension of ourselves too and i mean we see that a little bit today too you know with like computers and you know, the, what mm. does a computer do? It computes information for us. It stores information for us. And I mean, in a way, that is kind of an extension of ourselves too. But I see what you mean. And I love that idea too. And I think humans kind of have a tendency to, to anthropomorphize, well, everything, but <laughs> especially in terms of robots, you know, with our best qualities, with our worst qualities too. And um, a lot of times too, a lot of creators don't like to take kind of the personal responsibility too, and you have the worst impulses too. But when we see things like, um, um, you know, a lot of data hubs for machine learning are include um, Reddit, for example. As we know, Reddit is a very toxic place too. And I, I asked these these uh, researchers, you know, who were doing work on Reddit. They came up with a thing called Reddit bias, which removes a lot of the bias. I said, do we have to use Reddit? And you know, well, they don't use 4chan, thank God, but they use Reddit as a data hub for all this machine learning. And I said, well, it's so toxic. Like, you're just going to be you know, using the bias tool forever. Uh, but they said there's actually a lot of useful information there too. But, you know, like you said too, that it also brings out our worst impulses too. So I don't know. 
I don't know. I'm a little bit skeptical about Reddit as a data hub, but I know it has a lot of information that is useful for machine learning. But at the same time, you know, there's also that that dark side. I mean, four chan and Reddit. That's where kind of incels, the modern the modern idea of incel <laughs> kind of arises, right? So there's a dark side to yeah. Uh, Wow. And also, you said something else that made me wonder if you, because you said you're you're interested in medieval medieval um, literature and alchemy. Um, have you stumbled across Jung when you were doing all that? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Actually, it was really interesting too. I, I actually mentioned him in my book. Um, I didn't have a sl slide with my book too, but I, my book finally came out with my PhD dissertation. Uh, I don't, I, I find Jung really interesting because, uh, he kind of has a lot of these psychological interpretations of alchemy too, and he links everything to psychology. And I think that that does work But I think in my book, I, mo I moved away from it because there's a lot of material evidence for the existence of alchemy, too. So he says a lot of it's like dream symbolism and that sort of thing, too. Really fascinating stuff. He has two books on it. Uh, I forget the names of the book offhand, too. But they also had him in a lot of the early uh, history of science, history of alchemy journals, which is really cool, too. Um, so, yeah, I, I do like a lot of Young's work, too. And it's interesting, too, when you look at kind of uh, contemporary, um, you know, or 20th century discoveries, too, you know, when they were... dealing with nuclear fusion, you know, they or radio, radioactive carbon dating, uh, they always kind of say, oh, it's alchemy, because they don't have a, a word a word for it, too, which is really cool. And my research, too, because I kind of went from medieval to contemporary, I uh, I was looking at kind of intersections, too. One intersection for me was the link uh, between the uh, alchemy and uh, the the medieval auton automaton. Um, and this is the, uh, the homunculus, which is kind of a you know, medieval test tube baby. So a lab grown uh, fetus, uh, which is said to have kind of superhuman powers too. But that's kind of interesting too, because uh, there's a bit of a link there. But there's a wonderful book uh, called Medieval Robots uh, by E.R. Truitt. And that's a really good starting point. That has inspired me to think about medieval robots um, too. I'd, I'd love to write more on that someday. <laughs> um, but yeah, I wrote a I wrote a, a, a online article for, um, I'll send it to Rhea too, um, It's on um, uh, the homunculus, the kind of, because the homunculus came up under Paracelsus in the early modern period. There's kind of early ex earlier examples in late medieval literature of of kind of this, you know, pest to baby robot or whatever you want to call it to coming up to. So I published that on one of Cambridge's uh, online websites. So, you know, I'll try and circulate that too. Yeah, great, uh, great insights. <laughs> Oh, no, it's a lot, of, a lot of interesting stuff. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. <laughs> Every day is an adventure. That's a good note to finish on, I think. Every day is an adventure. Um, it's been really great hosting you here in Korea Tisaw. Thank you for coming all this way. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. Uh, thanks for all your wonderful questions. And uh, I wish you well with everything too, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to... Uh, stop the recording and I'm just we'll have a little goodbye for a minute um, if there's any last questions I see Annika saying thank you so much it was a fun topic to listen to fantastic oh my pleasure Kian. <laughs>